Greetings, and just uh, want to welcome you all to our call today. And I'll be introducing Rob Hopkins shortly. Wanted to let you know that this call is sponsored by Transition US, the national hub of the transition movement, um, now in 50 countries around the world. And there's more information about uh, transition towns um, at transitionus.org also transitionnetwork.org. And our principal aim in providing these events is to support the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are mulling over starting an initiative, and community leaders all around the world who are working on resilience building within their communities. And we do want to offer these events at no cost and ask you to consider a donation to Transition US. Um, our website again is transitionus.org, and thank you so much for supporting us in that way, if you're able to. Um, so without further ado, again, thank you all for your patience. Um, I want to introduce our speaker and turn it over to him. Um, today's call or conversation is really about his new book, uh, which he harvested, uh, 21 Stories of Transition. And it's also about uh, Rob's time at COP21 in Paris that just finished. So we'll hear a bit about that as well. So Rob Hopkins is the co-founder of both Transition Town Top Nest and the Transition Network. He is a serial blogger, and he's the author of, again, 21 Stories of Transition, um, and several other books, The Power of Just Doing Stuff, The Transition Handbook, and The Transition Companion. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Plymouth and an honorary doctorate by the University of West of England. Uh, in 2012, he was voted one of the Independent's Top 100 Environmentalists and one of Britain's 50 New Radicals. He's an Ashoka Fellow, a keen gardener, and one of the founders of the New Lion Brewery in Totnes. So when you're there, definitely have a brew. And he's a director of Atmos Totnes, a very ambitious community-led development project. So those are a few of the things that uh, Rob has done, and I'm going to turn it over to you now, Rob, with just a hearty, hearty welcome. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing all about your your journey to Paris and uh, the new book and how how it was received. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Wonderful. Um, uh, greetings, everybody, <clears throat> and apologies for the, uh, the delay in getting started. We had a few connection issues at this end. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Carolyn, for the introduction. I think being called a serial blogger makes it sound like I write reviews of cornflakes and stuff, but um, uh, I'm very glad that you've all come. Thank you. And uh, I just got back from Paris a few days ago, and uh, it was a really fascinating moment in history. I, I felt from, from a few months ahead that, that it was a, a moment in history that I wanted to be able to taste the air at. Uh, it felt like something I wanted to be able to tell my grandchildren about. And actually it did have that feel to it. It felt like quite a, quite a remarkable uh, shift happened on some level. And I know there's, a, <clears throat> there's lots of debates post COP21 about whether the agreement was as good as it should have been and the, the loops in it and stuff. All I can say is, is it felt to me like, like a moment in history when, uh, when support, when, when consensus support for, for, for fossil fuels started to really ebb away. And uh, I went to an, a remarkable event in the COP21 itself that was um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Denmark, Sweden, France, Norway, all talking very seriously about pledging to end subsidies to fossil fuels. And I saw an email today where um, a head of a coal company had said after COP21 in a rather 
angry email to his staff. Oh, well, since COP21, <clears throat> we are now seen as being like slave traders we've seen 150 years ago. You know, I think there's really, in the same way the divest movement has been about taking cultural support away from fossil fuels, I think COP21 is doing the same. And set them, setting one and a half degrees as a pledge <clears throat> is something that really focuses the mind and raises some very powerful questions. So. We, we sat down about six months ago and thought, what would we like transition movements' contribution to COP21 to be? We thought, actually, there's loads of organizations and people writing big, thick reports with lots of graphs and lots of policy demands and saying, we need you to do this, that, and the other. And we thought, actually, there's enough of that stuff. And actually, that's not what the transition movement does so well. And what we do is, is we, we've had this experiment running for the last 10 years, and we now have, as Caroline said, transition groups in 50 countries around the world. And what we wanted to do was to show that this was a movement that was having a real impact. Somebody once rather patronizingly described the transition movement to me by saying, well, we're not going to change the world very much with a few community gardens, which firstly felt like it totally, totally missed the point because obviously that's a lot more to it than that. Secondly, community gardens are great and in many ways they're a way in. You know, we, what we wanted to do was to also recognize that just the big impressive projects aren't the only thing that transition does and it's not that the big projects matter more than the small ones because often there's an assumption that the way that people come into uh, climate activism is going from a point of knowing nothing about it at all to all of a sudden being like completely engaged and doing amazing projects. And I'm sure most of you listening will know that, that the journey doesn't go like that. You know, we, we build confidence in stages. And so those smaller projects matter just as much as the big projects because they bring people in, they give them confidence, they set them on the, give them the confidence to take the next step and so on. So, we, uh, we did a call out to transition groups around the world and we asked them to send us in the stories that they would like us to share at COP21. And we were sent in many, many stories from all over the world. And if you're somebody who sent in a story that didn't make it into the final 21, uh, thank you so much for your, um, for your contribution. The competition was very, very stiff. And uh, so in the end, we chose our 21. And from those, we pulled out a lot of uh, stuff where we could get measurable, tangible data uh, and put that alongside the less tangible kind of stuff. So what I want to do, those of you who have the slides, uh, if we could just go to the first one there, which is the map of the world, which just gives you a sense of where some of these stories came from. So the 21 stories that appeared in the book, and it's a book that we produced in English and in French, and we took both language copies uh, with us to Paris. Um, the 21 stories in there actually contain stories from 39 different transition groups in 15 countries around the world. So what I want to do before I say a bit more about what happened in Paris is to tell you some of those stories. So the first slide after that of the people on the bicycles, this is a story from Scotland in a place called Black Isle. And Black Isle is a peninsula, a population of about 13,000, and very, very car dependent. They, people mostly drive from there to work in other places. So Transition Black Isle designed a three-year program to reduce the amount of car traveled by a million miles. And uh, they set out to do that through a whole range of different things. They, they uh, got people, uh, they had a, a lift share program that they set up. They got people uh, doing trainings about how to drive in a more fuel efficient way. They gave out vouchers for people to use the bus. They set up bike racks. They set up a map for how different ways to get into the town. They trained people to become more confident with, with cycling. They have doctor bike workshops so that people could uh, learn to, to repair their own bikes. Uh, a whole range of different stuff that, that could only really happen from the community. Government couldn't have done it. It worked because it came from the community itself. At the end of the three years, they had actually cut car travel by 1.3 million miles, which is an equivalent to driving to the moon and back two and a half times. They also uh, uh, increased the, amount, the number of miles cycled by 131,000 and led to 74,000 more miles being walked than were walked before. 
And when I asked them if they had a message for COP21, they said local groups are best placed to devise and run campaigns to change behavior, cut carbon emissions, and create community cohesion. And that's really what comes through in many of these stories, that actually communities can do stuff in a way that, that government can't. So the next uh, image is, is from Brixton in London. This is Brixton Energy, a community energy company. And community energy was one of the strands, again, that came through very strongly in the book of, of communities all over the world setting up their own community energy companies. And in, this, in the book, we pulled together seven from across the UK. And between them, they had raised about £13 million pounds worth of local investment, in their local people investing into their local economies. And for me, one of the, uh, one of the um, extensions of the divestment movement is a reinvestment movement. And uh, this is, community energy offers a really powerful example of, of what that could mean. These schemes between them have saved about 9,000 tons of carbon, and they generate enough electricity for about 4,000 homes. And this is just seven or eight uh, uh, projects here. The key question that comes through for me when you look at all of these projects is, what are they actually generating? Sure, they're generating kilowatts, but actually they're generating community, they're generating self-belief. Here in this photo here, this is young people in Brixton, one of the poorer areas in South London, uh, being trained to become solar PV installers. And some of the money from this, these schemes goes towards energy efficiency in the houses of the, of the people living underneath. And um, so community energy feels like a really, really key part of the puzzle here. And when we spoke to... Um, uh, uh, Peter Kapener from Bath and West Community Energy, which is one of the key success stories, and we asked him what his message was for COP21. He said, we don't need governments to show us how to make the changes we need, but we do need governments to work with us to create the conditions within which change can flourish, scale, and be embedded at a, at a societal level. And for me, being in Paris, that was one of the key things, messages we were trying to get there, was to say, actually, do you know what? Whatever you decide here, you're about 10 years behind everyone else. Actually, there is a new, there's an unstoppable shift now. The tipping point has been passed. The low-carbon uh, economy is now inevitable. Keep up with this process. You know, we're not here begging for you to do something. We're just telling you what's already happening and inviting you to get behind it and support it. Okay, so the next picture is from South Africa. This is the first transition group in Africa in Grayton where their work is mostly with young people. So they're working in a, in, in a community that is suffering many of the impacts left over from apartheid, very, uh, very sort of polarized uh, uh, society. And they're work, working mostly in, in schools. They have this amazing uh, swap shop thing where people bring in recyclable waste that they can swap for clothes and food. And uh, they're doing a project called Trash to Treasure. So many of you listening, I'm sure, will have spent your teenage years going to rock festivals where you go to a beautiful green field site and then spend four days listening to music and covering it in rubbish. And uh, they, uh, a young lad from the US went out to um, Grayton and went to the town dump, which is in a beautiful place on the edge of the town overlooking the mountains. And he said, I realized I spent all my youth going to these festivals. And actually, what would it look like if we had a festival where we spent four days going to a site that was already covered in rubbish and we spent four days cleaning it up. And that was where the idea of the Trash to Treasure Festival came from. So they're building a, a kind of a training center on the, on the dump, using materials from the dump, including old plastic bottles stuffed with plastic, they call them eco bricks, and the students do that. This is a, um, a, a reforestation project that you can see here in the photo. Next is a picture of the Brixton Pound's uh, fifth anniversary uh, celebratory banknote that was designed by a Turner Prize winning artist here in the UK called Jeremy Della. And what I love about this is it really just presents a very different picture as to what money could be. So they call the Brixton Pound money that sticks to Brixton. And uh, this money for me is really just a, a, a complete reimagining of, of what money could be. And uh, one of the guys who I spoke to there, he described the Brixton Pound as wonderful invites to us all to step into a better future. When we added up the different local currency schemes that are running, 
uh, across the UK and in parts of France and Belgium, the ones that we think of as sort of transition currencies. There's already over a million pounds worth of them in circulation. In the city of Bristol now, you can spend them on the city buses. The mayor takes his full salary in them. Um, and uh, you can pay your council tax with them, you can buy train tickets with them, you can pay your energy bills with them. Uh, and when I was in Paris, one of the highlights was the launch of a new film called Demain, which is the French for tomorrow. And, uh, and in that film, uh, Transition is kind of one of the stars of the film. They paid a visit here to Totnes, and on the, poster of the, uh, uh, on the poster for the film is a picture of me holding a 21 pound note, a topless 21 pound note, we have a 21 pound note, and in the film they say, why do you have a 21 pound note? And I say, well, why not? Uh, because you can. And uh, that somehow kind of uh, is one of the key things that people remember coming out of the film. And being in France, uh, I went to three screenings of it, and there were so many young people at them, it was really, really heartening. And one of the things they all came out with saying was, we want to start our own currency schemes. So this is an idea that's, that's that's really kind of infectious and spreading all over the place. And uh, in the book, there's also a picture of a local currency started by a transition group in Mexico, uh, which are round. And I quite like the idea of a place that has uh, round money. Um, okay, the next picture is uh, from Pasadena, which is the repair cafe in Pasadena. One of the things I love in transition is how one place comes up with a, with a good idea and then other places pick it up and replicate that idea. And uh, this was the, somebody in Pasadena just read about um, uh, the uh, repair cafe in the Netherlands, I think it was, and thought, oh, we could do that. Let's have a go at that. And uh, they run 13 of them a year. And one of the things I loved that they told me was they said, when you come to a repair cafe in Pasadena, you can bring most things and we'll try and fix them. They have guys come from NASA and from Caltech up the road who come and fix things. And there's a lovely quote in the book where somebody says, I can't believe the guy who designed the Mars rover just fixed my electric shaver. And uh, they say that when people come, it's completely free. The only, uh, the only deal is that you sit in a chair opposite them and tell them a story about your life while they fix it. So again, I would ask you, what is being fixed here? What is being repaired here? It's not the toaster. It's not the shaver. It's not the, the curtains that need fixing. It's about conversation. It's about community. It's about bringing back together that which has been shattered to pieces over the last 30, 40 years. And the Pasadena Repair Cafe is a really beautiful example of that. Next is, um, this is a picture now from Wales of uh, people working in a kitchen and uh, preparing food. And this is the uh, uh, Brogwan um, Community Kitchen, Transition Cafe rather. And this is what they call a surplus food cafe. So. A few people involved in transition there started going around. They had pigs and they wanted to get food that was being thrown away to feed their pigs. They went around the supermarkets, the food shops. They realized after a while there was so much food being thrown away that, uh, that, that, they, that they could do something else with it. So they started the idea of a cafe that just used uh, a food that was still fine to eat, but that the shops were, were getting rid of. That led to the idea of, uh, of this cafe. And it's one, been one of the loveliest things about doing the 21 stories is that for each of the um, groups who've been, who've been in it, what they've done with the fact that they appeared in this book. So most of them created a, a, a video that they made just to celebrate being in it. And if you have a look at the website, cop21.transitionnetwork.org, we created a special site. So that's cop 21 transitionnetwork.org and you'll find each of the stories on there and for many of them they have their own video and the video for this story is really really lovely uh, they keep every year uh, 21 tons of food uh, out of landfill uh, and uh, no, 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 sorry, they keep 600 kilos of food out of landfill that's 21 tons of carbon that they save every year and when I asked them what their message for COP21 would be, they said, if the world leaders came to the cafe for a visit, we'd show them all the entries in our visitors book, which tell them how excited people get about what we're doing, how a simple, small community project can be so effective in changing attitudes, modeling a new approach, and infusing people to do something similar. And that people think there should be a lot more initiatives like ours. 
I loved about this project that actually for them, they weren't designing a project that they would still be doing in 20 years' time. They said, if we get to the stage where awareness about food waste had reached the level that actually no, not enough food was thrown away for us to be able to run this cafe and we had to go out of business, for us that would be a, a sign of enormous success. And I love the humility that's designed into that from the start. Okay, so the next story uh, brings us to Totnes, actually, where I'm speaking to you from today, uh, where the transition idea kind of really got going. And this is a project here called Caring Town Totnes. And Caring Town Totnes is a really interesting look at where transition can go. So it's not just about a transition group trying to do loads of projects. This is when a transition group takes a step back and becomes an enabler. So when a transition group becomes a kind of facilitator, doesn't necessarily put its brand all over everything, but it, it, it brings people together to have the conversations that need to happen. So in the UK at the moment, we're seeing this appalling government-led austerity agenda, which is really uh, impacting on, on care and local government cutting their funding for care across the board. So in Totnes, uh, we brought together about 60 different local organizations that are involved in providing care in one way or another and asked them, how might we do this in a different way? And it led to some really, uh, um, to, to a, some amazing workshops that brought them all together, then to a big public fair where all those organizations were present. And now it's leading to them working together in a different way, looking at the whole thing about bringing assets into community ownership, in the photo here, you see one of their consultations where there are boards up which ask people, what makes you well? What makes you unwell? And people are asked to fill it in. And you might imagine people would say, what makes you unwell? Uh, disease. Actually, the key things that came through that made people unwell were stress, were loneliness, were uh, uh, worries about money. Um, and here in the UK, sociologists now talk about there being an epidemic of loneliness. And so for us, Actually, Caring Town Totnes says, what would it look like if we looked at transition through this lens and we put care at the heart of it? We put public health at the heart of it. Uh, and this is a project which is still unfolding, but which I think is, is breaking some very interesting ground in that, in that way. Okay, so the next picture takes us to London, to Brixton, and to something called a Local Entrepreneur Forum. A Local Entrepreneur Forum was something that we developed initially here at Totnes. And the idea was, uh, how do we bring a new economy into being? If we realize, you know, if we read Michael Schumann's books and stuff that Bali are doing, and, and we think, okay, so we want to shift the economy of the place that we need to have a lot more new, more local, resilience-focused enterprises, how do, we, how do we bring them about? So the idea was that we have a number of uh, entrepreneurs who present their business, tell us what they're doing, uh, get, people get to ask them questions, and then people offer them support. We've run four of them in Totnes so far. So far, there's about 20 businesses have gone through it. Most of them are now up and running. Between the four of, of those events, about £70,000 worth of support was pledged to those businesses. This was the first one outside of Totnes, and it worked really, really amazing well. And uh, particularly for the people who had the enterprises, I think for them to feel the kind of support that the room one woman I spoke to afterwards, she said, just sat down afterwards and saying, well, that was amazing. Let's go to loads of these because, but I don't really know where we would go now because I think it's probably quite exceptional. I've never seen another one. And uh, uh, the thing that struck me was the amount of times people were talking about love in the context of what was happening in the space. You know, oh, so much love in the room. And actually... Transition can do that in terms of creating events like this. And this is, uh, it's a model that can, can easily be replicated in different places. Our next one takes us to Liège in, in Belgium with a project called Centur d'Alimentaire, which means food belt, which is about connecting uh, the city of Liège with the food belt around the city. So it used to be that the food belt around Liège fed Liège. It doesn't happen anymore. This is a very ambitious project that has come through Liège en Transition, which is about putting in place a series of micro farms all around Liège to reconnect it with the city. They've, they've been uh, raising a lot of money through, through crowd funds and through different investments, and they've got a number of those farms up and running now. But for me, it's one of the ways, again, that shows where the future of transition goes in terms of that really strategic thinking, that strategic reconnecting of, uh, of city 
and land around it, and the whole new economy that we can create from that. You know, it's one of the stories that comes to really strongly, the things that comes to really strongly in the 21 stories, is saying there's a really exciting new economy here to be created. When we looked at the, um, uh, some of the other data that's in the front of the book was that, for example, the stories in here have generated about 18,500 hours of volunteer time. And that was just from the six or seven stories that actually captured that data. So it's, it's, um, it's a really, uh, you know, uh, there's a huge amount that we can be measuring here, but then also there's all the stuff that we don't measure and the, 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 the degree to which people feel more connected and more part of something, and more able to make change happen, feel happier, healthier, all that kind of stuff. So uh, the next story is, is in Brazil, and this is uh, uh, in, in Sao Paulo, which is suffering the worst drought in its history, what they call a hydric collapse in the city where the reservoirs are now down to about 15%. This is two different communities, Brasilândia, which is a favela, and Granja Viana, which is a more middle-class neighborhood, uh, where both are now starting to put in rainwater harvesting. But they found that in, in Brasilândia, people weren't able to do it properly. They didn't have the expertise. And so there was outbreaks of dengue fever where mosquitoes were getting into the water. And so uh, this was a project where they're training people to do this properly uh, in both communities. So it's a lovely example of how a transition can bring very different communities together to support each other in making the change that we need to make. So just two more to go, and this next one is one of my favorite ones. This is in, in Brussels, in Belgium. And this is in a, a, a neighborhood called Mille Bruxelles, or 1000 Brussels. And this is, uh, this is a red light district in the middle of Brussels, and the street in this picture, uh, which shows a street with a, with a garden in the middle of it, uh, was a street where people drove up and down looking for women, a kind of curb-crawling place, and the people who lived on either side of the street, many of whom had families, suffered from many of the problems that people living in and around prostitution experience. So, their local council decided that to try and stop the curb crawling, they would put concrete blocks, which you can just see in the bottom left-hand corner of this picture, uh, to stop people doing that. So the transition group then went to the council and said, we think we can do a bit better than that. We'd like to build a garden. So one Saturday, uh, a whole load of people, once they got the permission, a load of people came out, they built these gardens, this garden here. The council provided money for... Uh, for, the, for the materials, and the people provided the labor. It contains 13 one-meter square beds, and each one of those is gardened by a different family on the street. Uh, people said that before this garden was built, nobody would ever stop. This is a part of the city you, you just didn't stop in. So I talked to a guy, Sebastian Mathieu, there. He said to me, this garden changed the street enormously because before it was never a street that you would walk by or stop in. And now I get to stop here and spend several hours a week taking care of my little plot of land. And even the people who are not part of the group, it changed the perception of what, what a neighborhood is. We see a lot more people smiling and stopping by to chat and to spend some time here. A few weeks ago, they told me uh, that um, uh, a tour guide taking people on tours around, top, uh, around Brussels, seeing the people who walk around with the sort of carrying the flag that everyone has to follow, turned up at their garden with a group of tourists. And this idea of vegetable tourism is something that we've also seen come through the uh, incredible edible uh, movement as well here. Um, I love the, the 13 as well in terms of the number of beds here because a number of neighboring streets started to come to them and say, can we have one too? Can you help us make one in our road too? And they said, well, we'd love to. Uh, if you can get 13 people on your street together, we'll come and build a garden. And there's something about 13 as a number because it's, it's achievable. You could imagine getting 13 of your neighbors together. The chances are you don't already know 13. So getting to 13 involves knocking on doors, having conversations with people you may not have had conversations with before. There's also an amazing, which I don't have time to tell you now, but you'll find it on the Transition Network website, an amazing story about how this garden brought together this group of people and gave them the confidence then to do another project, which is one of the most amazing and heartwarming 
community responses to the refugee crisis that you'll ever read about. So, uh, so I would suggest that as, as, as reading for the next step following on from this. The last one uh, takes us to the uh, northeast of France in a place called Ungersheim. And Ungersheim is in the Alsace region. It's the former potash mining region. The potash mining closed in the 70s. And uh, the mayor of Ungersheim is an incredible man called Jean-Claude Mensch. And uh, he was already interested in doing sustainability things. He'd done some good stuff with renewable energy. And in about 2009, a visiting group uh, uh, had a meeting in his office where they showed the film In Transition 1.0. And at the end of the film, he said, yeah, that, yeah, we'll do that. And I get to visit lots of local authorities who say to me, oh, well, we're doing transition. Actually, what they mean is they've taken one bit of transition. So they might be doing some renewable energy. They might be doing some local food projects or whatever. What's really remarkable about what's happening in Ulmsheim is he picked up the whole lot. He picked up the whole kind of joined up, holistic sort of thinking behind the whole thing and has just done it all. The picture you see in the middle here is the, uh, they got rid of the, the, uh, the bus, the school bus, and instead bought a horse and a horse-drawn uh, uh, carriage thing, and all the kids get picked up and taken to school drawn by a horse. Uh, the horse then works out at the market garden during the day, and then comes back and picks the kids up from school. They launched a local currency called the Radish, which you can see there. Uh, they opened a 5.3 megawatt solar farm, which you can see there, which is the biggest solar farm in Alsace, which is uh, also a new business park on the edge of the town. They uh, announced that all the meals in the schools in, in, uh, in Ongersheim would be 100% organic. And the, the, the mayor's office make available a 15-acre site for a, a community-supported agriculture scheme, which grows food uh, to supply the local village, the local schools, and local markets, and so on. The building you can see in the photograph, the beautiful building with the wood shingle roof, uh, is a building being built by the mayor's office as a food processing center uh, for that market garden. They've replaced all the lighting in the town to be low energy. They've become a fair trade town. Uh, they've mapped all the biodiversity in the area. Uh, they've installed a uh, renewable energy from swimming pool is now all heated with renewable energy, changed all the public lighting. Uh, when I was there, they brought Greenpeace over from Switzerland who taught young people in the local school, this is the La Semaine Solaire, which means Solar Week, uh, where they trained all of those young people in the local school how to evaluate the solar potential of a rooftop, and then they went all around the time and they evaluated the solar potential of the entire town and reckoned that 70% of the, 77% of the town's energy uh, could come from the rooftops. So when I was... Oh, so when I was in um, when I was in Paris, there was we had a launch of the French version of this book in uh, in a venue there, and the mayor of Ingersheim came, and the guys from Mille Bruxelles came, and uh, and it was it was very very uh, celebratory. So what we did really, I suppose, when we were in Paris, was we wanted to make the most of having this book and trying to get it into as many different people's hands as possible. So we gave, so Christi, Christiana Figueres, who was one of the key coordinators uh, of the COP21 talks, had a copy uh, and um, we really tried to, uh, tried to get it to as many people as we could. And uh, um, I suppose my key sort of reflection coming back from Paris after a week where I was able to go into the negotiations themselves where I was able to go to some bizarre government-organized greenwashing events which had sort of snatch squads of secret police dragging demonstrators out uh, to some amazing kind of uh, the transition group organized these sort of transition tours around Paris looking at different projects uh, to some delightful uh, transition evenings and stuff around this film that I mentioned before, Demain, which is a huge, is currently the eighth most popular film in France, and is basically a film about transition, uh, was that actually the time is really right, and that people, and people inside COP21 were so hungry for positive stories, were so hungry for stories across a range of scales, from a few people in the street in Brussels starting a garden, to the mayor of a town saying, let's do transition for everything, 
those stories are so, so people are so hungry for them, and as well as the sticks that we need in order to, to sort of uh, uh, knock our politicians with, we also need the carrots and, and, and the vision and the dream. And before we stop for questions, I just want to read you one little bit out of the introduction to this book. So by the way, 21 Stories of Transition, it can be ordered um, on the COP uh, through the Transition Network website. And if transition groups want to order in bulk, uh, you can do that. And, and there's discounts for, for ordering uh, boxes in bulk. And uh, it's 96 pages full color and one of the most beautiful things we've ever produced, I say so myself. And this is this, the last bit I'll just read to you and then we'll open it up to some questions because you've sat so patiently and listened to me for quite long enough, I'm sure. Something brilliant and historic is already underway. And our message to the Obamas Cameron and Merkels of this world is that it's already happening without them and they need to support and enable it. But even if they do nothing, it will continue to grow because it's the future. Thank you very much. And we'll have some questions. Rob, thank you so much. Um, and I know we struggled with the audio quality. It's still not great, but uh, thank you for for the presentation and I did want to remind participants that they can press 1 on your keypad, um, your phone keypad or if you're calling in by, by Skype you can enable the keypad um, and so please just go ahead if you have questions or comments about uh, anything that Rob brought up, press 1 on your keypad and I'll call on you. Um, Nils, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nils Paulson. I work with Transition US. I work with Caroline in Sebastopol, California. Uh, I am serving as a communications director for Transition US and I first would like to say thank you to Rob for not only for taking time to share this with us today, but just for all the blogging you're doing out there and um, just great service for the transition movement. Uh, my, my real comment right now, actually, um, is, is that this 21 Stories is inspiring me, and I've always been interested in narrative. And, you know, ever since my transition training five years ago, thinking about, you know, our peak moments and how we all discovered transition and all the great work that's happening, it's got to be sung. It's got to be told. So my invitation for anyone out there who's listening across the U.S. is that uh, we're beginning to, we're continuing to do our own harvesting of transition stories. And I want to encourage, uh, as, as Tolstoy said, if you want to be universal, sing your village. So if any transitioners out there are wanting to sing your village, um, I would encourage you to, to send us something, if you ever feel like it, at uh, stories, that's S-T-O-R-I-E-S, at transitionus.org, and we'll be continuing to harvest these stories. And I just, once again, just a big thank you uh, to Rob and to everyone who's participating, and thank you, uh, Caroline, for putting this together today. Thank you. I just was going to uh, say uh, thank you very much for that, and also, um, uh, absolutely, I think we very much see the 21 stories as a beginning, not as, a, not as an end and uh, we'll continue to, to harvest those. And um, uh, in terms of song, you, I, you might like to have a look at, there's, there's a, um, a composer and a, and a lyricist here in, here in Tottenham who are writing a, 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 what they, they're imagining. They're imagining, they came to me a while ago and said, Rob, 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 we've got this great idea. We want to do Transition Town the Musical. And uh, and I, 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 I couldn't stop giggling about it for about two days. And uh, the idea was that they wanted to do something that could go on Broadway as a musical about transition. And they've been crowdfunding, and it's, called, it's going to be called Something Wonderful in My Backyard, which is out of a blog that I wrote where I was fed up of anybody who said they didn't like poor development happening near them being called a NIMBY, that we should instead be called, being called SWIMBYs, because it's not that we don't want nothing in our backyard, we want something wonderful in our backyard. And they took that idea and they call it something wonderful in my backyard. So if you have a look on, um, if you Google something wonderful in my backyard, the musical, you'll find what they're up to as well. And uh, I think the power of song to communicate this stuff is huge too. 
Right. Thank you, Rob. Um, Liz Lafferty, I'm not sure. Did you have your hand up? No, it was an accident. Okay. <laughs> then I'll call on uh, Marissa. Go ahead, Marissa. Hi, Rob. Um, this is Marissa, also here in the transition office. Hi. Um, thanks for all that you did going in COP21 and all of your blogging. Um, I was reading that you were kind of frustrated with the, you know, emphasis on top-down solutions um, within the the negotiations and the um, the convention, and then there were kind of the bottom up solutions happening like on the margins in a suburb of Paris. But I was just curious since then if you've um, been digesting kind of opportunities for some of the larger institutions to support the bottom up um, solutions, just if you had any insights on that. Mm, that's a very good question. I, I think um, I think a lot of people, uh, certainly within a day or two of the final agreement being announced and people being able to read it, um, rushed to either praise it or damn it or something kind of in between. And I kind of feel like uh, I haven't written anything like that because I kind of feel as a, as a transition movement, we need to take some time to digest it, really, uh -huh. and, and what the implications of it are, because it opens up a huge amount in terms of new conversations, new possibilities, uh, the, the approach that we have and the stories we can tell and the 10-year experiment that we've been running really brings many of the pieces of the puzzle to the conversation. So they're now... So what, what the agreement enshrines is that 1.5 degrees is now the target, which was remarkable and which I didn't see coming at all. I thought that they would be arguing and they would just about get down to 2 degrees and that would be that. And although 1.5 degrees is kind of pretty much unattainable, it, it, it does... Uh, the conversations that that as a target opens are really fascinating, both in the context of what we should be now, how we can use it to try and stop things, you know, like new airports and uh, new fossil fuel developments and so on, but also in terms of what it makes possible and the transition narrative about it's, it goes beyond energy sources. It, you know, it, it goes to our economic model and the scale on which we do things. You know, we have a hugely powerful uh, uh, tested model uh, for, for a lot of that stuff. So, uh, but I, I kind of feel that it's a little bit too early to really, I, I, I sort of feel I need a couple of weeks off for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we need, we need to kind of, we need to sort of convene some conversations and really take some time to digest it. Um, but, but my sense is that we are now in a, in a very, very different landscape than we were in before. And the, 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 the narrative underpinning a lot of this stuff has really shifted. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, Mika, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I was, I'm just, I can't even speak. I'm so happy and grateful. Thank you for being there, Rob. Thank you for doing this amazing book. I'm going to be ordering it in bulk. I wanted to ask the same question Marissa already asked. That's what uh, friends are for. So let me do a shout out to Transition US for the amazing work that you are doing, including the Community Resilience Challenge. So anybody who wants to learn more about that and participate this year, go for it. I'm a fan. I'm not in the office, but I really um, believe it's an important um, way to shift the dial here in the U.S. And so my question for Rob now is, do you have um, any um, recommendations about maybe the top two or three ways in that you think are the most effective for shifting the, the local culture? You've talked about many, but um, what's, your, what's your gut on 
um, where people should start in their community? Um, well, I think I think what comes through really clearly in the stories is that food is a really good place to start. A lot of the groups start around food. The first projects they do are around food. So, uh, so I think convening projects around food is a great place to start. I think, um, I think another thing that comes through really clearly is that all the projects that are in that book work because because of the group. And one of the key things for me about transition is what we call inner transition, which is that element that says that the way in which you do a project is as important as the project. That the, 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 the being of the project is as important as the doing. And uh, we just, uh, so Sophie Banks, who developed the inner transition thing, is, is about to uh, step down from her role in transition, but, but uh, and there's stuff on the blog today about that. But um, that stuff is really now built into the DNA of transition. So I think for any group to, when it starts and it comes together, that it pays some time and energy and attention to how it's going to work as a group, how it's going to run its meetings, how it's going to manage conflicts, all that kind of stuff uh, is really, really vitally important. And maybe the third thing is um, to think of what you're doing as not being an environmental process or a, an engineering process or a, an economic process, but to think of it as a cultural process. You know, what you're aiming to do is to nudge the culture of the place where you live. And, and there's a beautiful quote that I, I don't know if it went in the book or, or not, which was from a French artist called Jean de Buffet, who used to say, art's best moments are when it forgets what it's called. And for me, the best moments of transition are when transition does what's not expected of it. And so that's, for me, the stories that are most exciting in the 21 stories are the stories that, where people aren't doing what you would expect of a community sustainability group. You know, there's all the things that people would imagine you would do, like planting some trees and having a jumble sale, or and all those things are, are fantastic and they're really important. But I love the moments when a group does things that just are not what you're supposed to do, like becoming a developer, for example, or um, uh, you know some of the stuff, with, some of the community energy stuff, thinking with that scale of ambition. Uh, so for me, I would say, yeah, keep it playful, think of it as a cultural thing, and do what's not expected of you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, David Wimberly, go ahead. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. I can hear you lovely. Hi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm out here in Nova Scotia at Transition Bay St. Margaret's, and Great. it was delightful that, uh, <laughs> uh, hi Rob, we've spoken a few times before. Uh, I'm Thanks. delighted about the previous call because it kind of introduces uh, a lot of what I wanted to bring up because I'm thinking more and more that it's that interchange that we really need to find ways to to bring it out and I know in recent times we've talked a lot in transition about you know the idea of just doing stuff and uh, not laying a heavy trip on people but it's also a fine line of not going too far in that direction so that the inner transition doesn't happen or isn't uh, brought out as a, to inspire people so I I'm working a lot on this idea of, of how you change the story change the future the thing that David Corton has written, and a lot of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm interested in how to bring the whole story of transition out in each project or program, particularly that inner transition. And in particular, we just did a program here on uh, compassion, our empathy training through this group Waves of Compassion. And I thought that had a, a huge amount of 
of uh, possibility to, if we can bring that compassion training and, comp and uh, building, doing what is best for the earth and all of society as the first thing that government, our business, our NGOs, or anyone does, uh, it would be a, a tremendous transition in our whole thinking instead of profit as being the, the prime imperative, but uh, benefit being the prime imperative. So uh, what would, you know, you, you talked about bringing love as, as core to what makes people unwell, and I think that's true. So how would you, what do you think about this? How can we go further in that in compassion training? Uh, one of the one of the stories that, that that I didn't talk about just now that's in here is from uh, Media Pennsylvania, the the free store there, and uh, I love how they describe the store there as being a compassion building exercise. And uh, what I've been doing with uh, with the 21 stories, and it's something that you might find uh, useful those of you who who go out and, and who give presentations about transition is it's it's they're they're, they're wonderful for um, for running through some of the stories and then inviting people to get together with the person next to them and to reflect on what are the threads they see running through the stories. And, uh, and then every, every time I do it, the stories that people come up with are different stories, which is really, really fascinating. And it leads you into some really great conversations. And um, I guess, I mean, for me, transition has always been a, about compassion building. It's, a, it's, a, it's work of service. It's work that we do uh, as a as an offering, I suppose, to the to, to the people where we live. Um, and uh, I guess I guess for me, it's always that balance between is is there a way? What are the skillful ways to talk about compassion so that we actually open up to more people rather than uh, you know frighten off some people? So it's a kind of about it but I think compassion is absolutely uh, the right lens to be looking at what we're doing through actually lovely thank you Rob um, we have Rua uh, Rua go ahead hi there um, hi Rob nice nice hi, to hear um, you. Um, and you so I'm really lucky I live in Vermont and in Vermont, is, we're in quite a bubble. Uh, things like local foods and all the wonderful local things that we can get. And when I've tried to spread the good word about transition, um, a town like uh, or a city like Burlington, people will say, we're already doing so many of these things. Why would we want to be part of the transition network? And although I have some answers for that, I'm wondering what what your answer would be. Uh, my answer would be uh, that it's not compulsory. <laughs> you know, people can <laughs> they don't have to do transition; it's entirely up to them. Um, that actually, uh, it. it that in places where nothing's happening, it can be a really wonderful way of catalyzing stuff happening. In places where there is stuff happening, often those things are sort of happening in isolation from each other. So transition can be a very useful way of bringing a more kind of holistic take to what's happening. And often that stuff tends to be very um, project-based and project-focused. You know, it's something which is about people just people just getting on and and doing the things that they do uh without a thought about uh how how those groups are going to work how sustainable they are so for me a lot of people i know who have worked just in very project focused things have actually found that addition a really useful piece have also found feeling part of a you know if you're just working on local food that's fine. You know, one of the stories in the book, one of the 21 stories is from Luxembourg where transition has arrived and taken off very quickly. And they are, there are three very different cooperatives that have started up through transition Luxembourg. One's a, an amazing community supported agriculture scheme. One's a, a community energy project and one is a kind of restaurant local food awareness center place. 
each of those could just be standalone projects, but actually they all feel part of this family. They feel part of the sort of under a transition umbrella, under, under an overarching narrative. And that's something that really gives the whole, uh, their work a lot more substance, a lot more meaning, uh, and they find it really valuable. So, uh, so I would say that actually what transition can bring in that situation is that projects can become much more than the sum of their parts, you know. Uh, also with the backup of uh, some very useful kind of social inner technologies about uh, how to actually design in the longevity and the sustainability and resilience of the people who are doing it. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Beth Gurney, go ahead. Hi, Beth. Hi. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Rob. Um, I'm actually on the board of Transition U.S. in uh, Santa Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? I can hear you fine, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. great. So I, I'm on the um, board of Transition U.S. and um, recently uh, fairly new to the board just this year. And first of all, I want to thank you so much. I'm just so heartened. <laughs> I can't tell you how heartening it is to hear these stories and to hear your experience at COP21 and actually to to feel that we are at a tipping point. Um, I'm sure all of us feel so amazed and excited by that, and um, it's well overdue, but it, it's happening, and that's great. Um, and thank you so much for all you've done to, to bring, help, help bring us to that point. Um, my question is that um, I've been talking with Caroline and Marissa and Niels and, uh, as a board member and, and the board, looking at our strategic direction for Transition U.S. for the next year and, and onward. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, Transition U.S. does a lot of different things, um, but we want to you know, get, kind of get the best bang for our resources. And uh, from your perspective, is there something that, uh, that maybe top two or three things that Transition U.S. as a national hub um, could be doing more of or could be doing new or um, this would be focusing on that would really help support and catalyze the efforts around uh, the U.S.? Oh, blimey, that's a very difficult question because I would, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure that I feel completely familiar enough with what you're already doing to comment in a way that might sort of make it sound like I'm being dismissive of things that are already happening to early. Um, I mean, all, all I could say, I suppose, is that actually the things that I see when I go to visit different transition groups that really click and that really resonate with people and that people want to hear more about are the re-economy side of things. And I know there's stuff been happening about re-economy in the U.S., but that, that idea that we need to move beyond transition just being something we do on our Wednesday evening once the kids are in bed uh, into something that becomes our livelihoods is really, really important, I think. And it's one of the things that comes through very strongly in these 21 stories, you know, is, is that thinking that goes, well, we could just do this as a project, or we can look at it as how we can create a livelihood. And often the people who are drawn to doing those things aren't necessarily people who have a, 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 a experience or a history that feels particularly drawn to starting businesses is not something that I'd ever really done before. In fact, I probably spent a lot of my life trying to get away from the idea that I would ever do such a thing. And now I'm involved in the brewery here, which is a social enterprise and with the Atmos project, as Carolyn said at the beginning. Uh, so I think giving people skills, confidence and expertise around that is one thing. Uh, I think the, the inner stuff around, uh, around healthy groups, effective groups, is really, really vital. And in fact, on the website, we have a theme every two months on the Transition Network website, and our theme for January and February is going to be burnout. And looking at that and talking to people who've been through that and looking at strategies uh, for avoiding that. So I think that's a key thing. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, the first thing I would say is I think actually you do what you already do, you do with such beautiful... Uh, heart and accessibility and sort of colorful and straightforward and accessible and um, and there's a, there's a kind of a, a quality and a character and a flavor that comes through what you do already that, that, that I think is you know should be really celebrated and, and cherished actually thank you so much uh, thank you so much, Rob, and I think we're almost at time. 
Um, so just want to, again, appreciate you for uh, this, this work that you've done with 21 Stories of Transition. Also, uh, your trip to COP21 and the blogs. Um, we linked to, to that in our recent newsletter, and I know that can be found on transitionnetwork.org. But it was so wonderful to have the team of transitioners there in France feeding stories to us all. So that was really rich, and thank you for that. And the last thing is I know you mentioned the film, Deman, uh, the French film, and you are in it. And for us English-speaking people that are not uh, familiar <laughs> not French speakers. Will that film be available and subtitled anytime soon? Uh, that's an extremely good question. I was just trying to find that out today. So uh, it's, it's now on release in France and Belgium. It comes out in Switzerland uh, this weekend and uh, I think in Austria a few days after. Um, it's uh, we are, I'm waiting to hear, so I've written to them to say what's happening with the UK release, uh, and we don't know yet. Um, but it is done, there's either, because about most of the people who speak in it speak in English, and then some bits of it are in French. So the version that we have at the premiere, whenever someone's French is speaking in English, Whenever someone was speaking French, it was subtitled in English. Whenever someone was speaking in English, it was subtitled in French. So whichever you were watching, you could follow it. But they have also got a full English version as well. And uh, so um, I will just, I'll keep you in the loop, kind of, so they're going to let me know about England and Iraq and the US, and, uh, and I'll just keep you posted. But if you have a look on, on YouTube uh, and you search for the trailer, uh, it's you're you're kind of get a feel of it. What what I loved about it was there are so many films which try to find that balance between telling a story with a sense of urgency about why we need to act and trying to find that balance between being really just too depressing or just bombarding people with grim images or appearing a bit too sort of naive and all we need to do is pass the trees and everything will be fine. They go into it really deep. Um, there's a real kind of uh, the way they introduce the problem and then give time to digest on it in a very beautiful way and then go off around the place just meeting people and telling their stories and looking for solutions is really, uh, I've not seen another film like it. It's really quite an amazing gift to this movement and the wider movement. Well, I definitely look forward to um, seeing that um, and uh, thank you for again, um, being a part of that film and all of the things that you're involved in. And just wanted to give you a chance for some closing comments um, before we, we close up today. So, yeah, any closing mm, comments? Well, well, firstly, to say thank you very much uh, for organizing this. And, uh, and I, hope it's, uh, I hope it's been useful to everybody. It's been a real joy to, to be able to share these, and, uh, and a few people mentioned ordering copies. But I think it's I, I think it's one of the loveliest things that, that we've produced yet. And if any of those of you who are listening who sent in stories, then then, then thank you so much for that. Um, I guess well, I guess I would just leave you with a there's a quote in the in the front which is from Laurel Beck, who some of you may know from Transition Pasadena. She said, I was deeply disturbed and sad about the state of the, wor the natural world and society. Getting involved with Transition Pasadena has meant going from despair to community and being able to follow a passion and get help with it. It changed my relationship to the problems. And I think for me, going to Paris, what we tried to bring, obviously we couldn't be everywhere and there was only a certain number of us. And, uh, what we tried to model when we went there was we, you know, obviously we wanted to bring the stories, we wanted to bring the knowledge that we had, but we also wanted to bring, uh, we also wanted to sort of move there with an integrity, we wanted to bring a flavor of, of, of the quality of transition to our interactions with people there. And I think what Laurel points to there about changing our relationship to the problem uh, was something that a lot of people talked about when they 
heard the stories, when they encountered what we were doing, when they came to some of the talks that we we're doing. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. And as a follow-up to the deal that has been signed, I think that's one of the key pieces that we can bring to the discussions that will happen in the new year. So thank you all very much for your time this morning. And, uh, and I wish you well in all your ongoing transition. And uh, as, as things happen, share those stories. You know, if a tree falls in the middle of the wood and no one's there to see it, it's just a tree falling in the middle of the woods, you know, or whatever the expression is, you know what I mean? But actually, uh, if you, something happens in your community and you share that story, you know, it can inspire people all around the world. That's one of the key things that comes through these stories from me. You know, somebody in, in the Netherlands starts a repair cafe three years later uh, in Pasadena, they're starting a repair cafe. You know, you have no idea when you start doing transition where it will go. And in the same way that we've talked about tipping points in terms of COP21, when you start doing a project in, in your transition group, you have no idea who will see it, who will be moved, who will be inspired, who will do something else as a result of it. Uh, and that, for me, is one of the key things. And I'll just leave you with a very brief little thing that, that, that is a summary of that, actually, that when I was in, Bristol, one of, in, in Paris, one of the events I spoke at was um, run by an organization called Energy Cities, which, which is um, mayors around the world who are sort of decarbonizing their towns. They're a very active network. And I spoke at an event, and then in the next panel after me, there was the deputy mayor of the city of Bristol. And she said at one point, uh, I came to hear Rob speak in Bristol in 2007, and I think that you know, most of those of us who were in the council who were driving this stuff forward heard that talk. And I could trace a lot of what we've done since back to hearing that talk. And actually... For me, you know, you have no idea when you go out and you talk in your community about the 21 stories or about transition, who's there, who you will affect. And it may sometimes feel like you're not getting anywhere, but you are. You so are. And, uh, and that's part of the magic of all of this, I think.